Welcome to Shockaholic, where we talk about the shocking sides of cinema. I am your host, Chandler Bullock, and today we're going to kick off what will be an ongoing series here in the channel, A Century of Horror. Now, horror films have been delighting and terrifying audiences for much longer than the last 100 years, but before around the 1920s, most horror films were either relatively short or slapstick comedies with a spooky theme. My goal for this series is to bring attention to some classics you might have missed, and maybe even sway your opinions about some of my personal favorites. I'll do my best to be as objective as possible, though. Each episode, I will list my top three films from each year between 1920 and 2020, and likely beyond. To keep things nice and tidy, I think it's good to set some ground rules about what qualifies for consideration. For a film to make this list, it needs to meet the following criteria. It should be a feature film with a runtime of at least 60 minutes. It should feature notable horror tropes, or at the very least, a horror-inspired theme or aesthetic. No miniseries, but TV movies are allowed as long as they were released as a movie and not part of a series. And last but not least, I'm going to include movies in the years that they were initially released according to databases such as allhorror.com and themoviedb.org. Now, I think this goes without saying, but spoiler alert for some of these films. I'll always do my best to keep spoilers at a minimum, but it's the ending of some of these titles that, well, that's led to them being positioned where they are. One thing, before we get started, I want to give a special shout out to Emma at Spooky Astronauts. Uh, this series was loosely inspired by me watching her Best Horror Movies of series on YouTube, in which each episode is dedicated to dissecting a different decade of horror. I realized how similar my idea ended up being to hers and reached out to check if this was all cool. She was really kind about the whole thing and she gave her blessing. Still, to give credit where it is due and because it's really a very interesting series that you should be watching, I'll have a link in the description of each video in this series so you guys can check out her favorites as well. If for some reason you managed to fall upon my video series before seeing hers, trust me, you'll be thankful that I've sent you that way. Now, without further ado, let's start talking about my top horror films from 1920. Okay, I know that I said that I'll be giving my top three for these videos, but I'm gonna bend the rules a bit right out the gate. There are a few reasons for this, okay? So just stay with me on this one. First, there are only five horror films released in 1920 that were not lost. This is a rather common issue for older films. You see, Many films have been lost due to poor storage practices on behalf of studios and filmmakers, legal disputes leading to certain properties being completely destroyed, accidents such as fires wiping out entire libraries of celluloid, or simply there being no copies made and those films are just sitting in someone's attic without them even knowing it. So I felt it was fitting to briefly discuss all five films in the hopes of enticing you guys to check them out. They're really all interesting to watch and I think they're all worth seeing at least once if you're a horror buff. Another reason I'm going to discuss all five is that there's actually a tie for the third and fourth spots. Now, I know, I know, the series hasn't even gotten started yet and crazy exceptions are popping up. I think you'll agree with me with why I couldn't pick between my number four and number three picks when we get there. But for now, let's take a look at number five. So coming in at number five is one of two horror films released by Robert Vina in 1920, both of which are on this list. The film Genuine, A Tale of a Vampire is Vina's second expressionist horror film released in 1920. Vina was hot off the success of his first major release, which we'll discuss in more detail later. He took a lot of the visual stylings that made him a global name in cinema, such as painted backdrops and hyper-stylized sets, and amped them up to 11. The result, unfortunately for Vina, wasn't quite as appreciated as he had hoped. Genuine was considered to be too frantic and wild to the eye. And keeping in mind that films at the time were all filmed in black and white, it, it's immediately evident when you watch it just how much an explosion of lines and shapes and exaggerated performances would have overwhelmed an audience at the time. To this day, it's still really difficult to make out where people are in the frame sometimes, even when it's tinted. Now, to make matters worse, the film was cut down severely from its original 88 minutes to a mere 45 minutes. Now, technically speaking, 45 minutes is still considered feature length, but the cuts were made to focus more on the dastardly deeds of the titular character Genuine as she seduces every man she crosses paths with. 
it's a shame uh, because I made sure to watch both versions of this for this video and the 88 minute version contains rather necessary plot elements that help the viewer understand certain character motivations and character development too. The film's plot is pretty simple. So we start with a man by the name of Percy who's clearly in a foul mood and refuses to hang out with his rich buddies. Instead, he falls asleep in his study while reading in front of his favorite painting, a depiction of a shamanistic queen, Genuine. Once Percy is asleep, Genuine steps out of the painting, and we are thrust back to discover who this person truly was. The title refers to Genuine as a vampire, but that was just a more common way of saying vamp, or seductress at the time. So don't be fooled, there are not any blood-sucking creatures in this movie. We'll get to that in a few episodes. Genuine is first shown doing uh, this and with her original tribe and it's not clear. It's details like this that have kept the movie from aging well actually. It's clear that Vina was more interested in shocking audiences with whatever they weren't exactly accustomed to at the time. In this case it means that it has savage depictions of other countries and races while also a, having a lustful woman as its main antagonist. I could go into more detail, but with it only being 45 minutes long, I highly suggest you check it out and judge for yourself. It's most certainly a difficult watch these days, considering the amount of reform and inclusivity many of us are working on, but I still found it to be a fascinating account of its time, and even more so when you compare it to Vina's earlier film of that very same year. If it weren't for 1920 only having five horror films to keep in mind, I would not have given Genuine much more than a mention, but I still find it interesting enough for a one-time viewing. Now, on to where my list gets a bit weird. Number four. Three? Three slash four? In any case, the next two spots in the list I really can't tear apart from each other. They're both American releases, and each of them have juggernaut actors delivering phenomenal performances as their respective film's core villain, I'm talking about John S. Robertson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and Wallace Worsley's The Penalty. I'm really having a hard time putting one of these above the other, and I'll explain why as we go. Let's start with the more traditional horror of Dr. Jekyll. By the time this film was released, Robert Louis Stevenson's classic novella, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, was already quite familiar for cinema audiences. By 1920, there had already been numerous versions of the film, and, well, hell, this wasn't even the only adaptation of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde that year! The only reason that I didn't include the other one was because it was only 40 minutes in length, and unlike Genuine, it wasn't cut down from a longer existing print. For audiences in 1920, a movie about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was about as interesting as Spider-Man getting another reboot for us this year. There were fans of the property, but most everyone had become so familiar with the story, it was really hard to do anything worthy of any note. Enter John Barrymore. Barrymore delivers not one, but two enthralling performances as the kind-hearted Dr. Jekyll and the salaciously vile Mr. Edward Hyde. Although there are prosthetics used in later scenes to amplify uh, Hyde's deterioration, it's Barrymore's performance that truly sets the two roles apart. The film begins with Jekyll having to inform a friend of his that he will no longer be able to be on time for his friend's gathering that evening. Uh, it's due to some work that he has to finish. Now mind you, he says all of this while he's packing up to leave his work at the uh, doctor's office. What a workaholic, am I right? I mean, we soon discover that the work that Dr. Jekyll referred to is a private clinic that he's opened up specifically to help the local homeless population with their medical woes. He does all of this in his own spare time for free. I mean, what a way to set your protagonist up as the nicest fucking guy to have ever existed. Once he's finished tending to his patients, he finally attends the party where all of the gentlemen there tease him for being too kind and for not giving in to his more carnal desires. Jekyll does a great job making everyone in attendance look like a giant prick, but the comments still visibly hurt him. He agrees to go into town with a few of his friends and is completely uncomfortable when they decide to visit a brothel and his friends try to hook him up with a prostitute. He excuses himself and goes home, annoyed, upset, and a little ashamed. The film handles Jekyll's weakness to peer pressure quite well, actually. 
that's ultimately the reason that he even makes the serum. Uh, he initially takes it simply to be able to let loose a bit. And let loose he does. <laughs> Like I said before, by 1920, people had seen various transformation scenes by various actors using various effects, so director John S. Robertson had a lot on his plate if he didn't want to have a film that was really just another footnote in the Jekyll Hyde pantheon. One reviewer at the time even mentioned how skeptical they were of the film, of what it could possibly achieve. In 1887, many of the same audiences now flooding the cinema halls were theatergoers who had witnessed Richard Mansfield transform nightly without using any prosthetics or any effects of any kind. The reviewer went on to basically eat their hat in praise of John Barrymore for doing the exact same thing in his initial transformation in the film. Just look at this. This was achieved purely by Barrymore contorting his body and stretching his facial muscles to create what is now one of cinema's most recognizable depictions of Mr. Hyde. Sure, they added some prosthetics throughout the movie, but it never took away from Barrymore's ability to switch characters at the turn of a dime. If that wasn't impressive enough for you, the man was performing on stage every night after filming in a production of Richard III. So, I mean, just put that into per to perspective for just a moment. The film's only major weakness, though, is how, although Mr. Hyde is terrifying to behold, he doesn't really do all that much. The intertitles continuously hype up the audience for sequences of depravity and true evil. But apart from one murder at the end of the film, Hyde doesn't really do much more than the average drunken asshole at the bar. He is horny as fuck in just about every scene, which is in line with the fact that Hyde is pretty much just the manifestation of Jekyll's repressed urges. But his actions still don't quite match what the intertitles set up. If you were to list the things that Hyde does in the film, there really isn't much variety. His escapades include visiting a brothel, moving in with a prostitute, visiting an opium den to leer at a prostitute, leering and groping prostitutes at a bar, suddenly breaking up with the prostitute he had moved in with, and oh yeah, eventually a murder. In a way, it's nice to know, though, that even in 1920, this sort of behavior was considered absolutely monstrous and not okay. Or Maybe it just shows that they established Dr. Jekyll is so goddamn wholesome that he didn't need to do much to fall far and be considered depraved in his behavior. Fortunately, the film really delivers in its final moments with one last transformation that leads to a vicious murder by means of a cudgel. It's a classic story depicted in such a way that the adaptation is just as much a classic as the original novella. John Barrymore would sadly die just 20 years later after suffering a nervous breakdown on stage. His passion for his craft would be his undoing. Still, his passion paid off, as it can still be witnessed and admired by audiences 100 years later. Hats off to you, Mr. Barrymore, and thank you for being as passionate about entertaining the masses as your Dr. Jekyll was about mending the sickly, the poor. Now this leads me to my next pick, which stands as a sort of cinematic twin to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The subject matter is vastly different, but it also features a performance like none other by one of the most beloved actors of the silent era. I'm talking about The Penalty, starring none other than the man with 1,000 faces himself, Lon Chaney. Whereas Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde celebrates and showcases horror front and center, The Penalty is almost difficult to classify as a horror film upon initial viewing. It's more of a crime melodrama than a horror film in most ways, but there's this undertone of dread and menace throughout that eventually culminates into some pretty dark body horror. In fact, the film's opening makes it look like it will be much more of a traditional tale of terror than it ends up being for quite a while. We kick things off with a young boy waking in a hospital bed after a car accident. To the boy's shock and horror, his legs have been amputated as a result of the accident. Except, we learn very quickly that the amputation was a mistake made by the junior doctor on duty when the boy arrived. He tries to tell his parents, but the doctors simply say that he's raving from the ether they use for the surgery. Ouch! What a dark opening for a movie from any year, much less one that's 100 years old. Eek. The rest of the film takes place 20 years later. The boy's an adult now, but he hasn't let that keep him down. In fact, uh, He's grown into a brutal crime boss now. Uh, he's known as Blizzard. Lon Chaney is stunningly sinister in this role. Uh, 
I'd love to give you a detailed account of the film's plot, but there's just so much going on here that I could fill an entire video just providing a succinct synopsis. This movie's plot consists of a sweatshop where Blizzard employs women to make thousands of hats, a dual narrative of Blizzard trying to exact revenge on the doctor that maimed him and the police's attempts to infiltrate his criminal organization, and a finale that spirals out into implied body horror. I honestly don't want to spoil too much, as it is all told rather effectively, and there are some great twists you just need to see for yourself. Believe it or not, this was Cheney's first ever feature film role. He was no stranger to acting, but acting on screen was completely new to him. You wouldn't think so judging from his performance, though. He plays to the camera with grace, knowing exactly how to take advantage of the framing of the screen. Like John Barrymore, Cheney gave his all for this performance. There's no camera trickery involved in making the rather naturally long-legged Lon Chaney become the legless blizzard. They simply strapped his legs together and covered his knees with the leather braces we see him hobble on. Chaney needed extensive leg massages after every shoot just to regain feeling in his legs. Likewise, there was no stunt personnel on set. Chaney performed every stunt you see with no rigging or wiring of any kind, meaning he actually climbed around the walls with just his upper body strength a feat that the director was well aware of that he could do and really wanted to showcase. Seriously, this movie is a sight to behold just for the crazily real stunts. It's also quite a sinister tale of revenge and manipulation that I think any horror fan can enjoy. I was genuinely unnerved at certain moments during the film. Still, I find it hard to separate this film and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde on this list. It's hard for me to really say if I find one better than the other or even more impactful both of them feature A-list performers wowing audiences early on in their film careers. Both of them feature wicked, monstrous men plowing through everything in their path. And both of them suffer a little from being maybe just a little too drawn out or not quite leaning into the horror as much as they could have. I feel equally passionate about suggesting to you that you watch both of these movies. And because of that, they share the third slash fourth place on this list. The final two films in this list gave me similar trouble. We very nearly had another pairing for number one and number two. Both films are quintessential examples of German expressionism, and they're both fueled by deep-seated trauma in Germany caused by the events of the First World War. I went back and forth on this for days. After some rewatches and some really careful consideration, I came to my conclusion. Only one could take the top spot, but believe me when I say, number two on this list is never far behind. I'm sure you've had enough controversy for one video, but I'm afraid I might have a little bit more for you because my pick for the second best horror film of 1920 is the first of two films released by Robert Wiener that year, and one that is considered by most to have birthed the horror genre as we know it today. That film is none other than The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Now, before you grab your torches and your pitchforks, please, please, please hear me out. I absolutely adore this film. As someone who grew up being marveled by the imaginative landscapes of Tim Burton, I have always had a special place in my heart for Caligari. Its impact on the horror genre cannot be overstated. So please, see this less as me bringing the love and appreciation for it down, but more as me elevating the status of my number one pick. That said, Let's get into what's so great about Venus Masterpiece. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is the movie that comes to mind for most people when discussing German Expressionism. The sets are simplistic, but still lavish to the eye due to their strange dimensions and fantastical drawn aesthetic. Much like Genuine, the main narrative of the film takes place as a flashback, as a man by the name of Francis tells an older man about the strangest thing to ever happen to him. The sets all serve as a means to accentuate the fact that Francis' account is completely subjective and gives the whole film the same vibe as an old fairy tale. Francis tells of the time in his hometown of Prague when a strange old man called Dr. Caligari arrived with his tent of wonders. Caligari is shown as a carny host whose main act is the somnambulist Cesare, whom Caligari can hypnotically control. Caligari is also shown to be up to no good. He uses the vampire like Cesare to commit a series of murders throughout town until Cesare is eventually caught after breaking from his hypnotism. 
Caligari flees the city, but Francis stays hot on his trail, only to discover that Dr. Caligari was all a lie. He was actually the head psychiatrist at the local asylum. Just at the moment that the deranged doctor is apprehended, we are thrust back into the present day, only for it to be revealed that Francis is standing in the exact same asylum and that he is one of the patients. We see various characters featured in Francis' story as the other patients, all of whom exhibiting various signs of trauma. Francis goes into a raving fit upon seeing the head psychiatrist appear, even though he seems much more kindly and gentle than he did in Francis' story. The film closes on Francis being locked away in isolation, and the head psychiatrist looking to the viewer with a smile. Was Francis telling the truth? Or are we just influenced by his madness? Who's to say? Therein lies the point. Germany was still reeling from World War I at the time. There were still questions that needed answers, and the trust in the nation's leaders was shattered. Soldiers were returning from the front lines, battered, shaken, and feeling used by their government. The cabinet of Dr. Caligari presents the viewer with a fantastical look into the psyche of the German collective at the time, and ends up forcing the viewer to participate just a little bit by way of its confounding ending. Although it is known that Robert Vina was behind the film's frame narrative, it is still a point of contention as to who is to thank for coming up with the hand-painted backdrops and winding sets. According to co-writer Hans Janowitz, every visual element seen in the film was written in the original script by Karl Meyer and himself. However, what is believed to be the original draft of the film's script was discovered not too long after Janowitz's statements, completely disproving his claims. The film is truly a sum of its creative parts, with Mayer and Janowitz's script, Walter Raimond, Walter Rorig, and Hermann Warm's close collaboration on the interior design, makeup, and costuming, and the cast giving their all, in particular Conrad Veidt's chilling depiction of somnambulist Cesare. Everyone delivers in their various roles, and the result is a film that would wind up influencing countless films over the course of the next century. It's absolutely no wonder that Genuine, A Tale of a Vampire, did not rise to the same heights that its predecessor did. Vina had already set the bar to perfection. Still, for all that this film achieved and the impact it has had on the horror genre, I feel there's one other film that just inches it out of the top spot. It's a tale that all starts on a quiet, starry night. Rabbi Low gazes upon the stars, wherein he finds a grave omen for the Jewish people of his community. He informs the other rabbis and begins work on finding a way to avert the disaster. Well, it isn't long before the omen's warning is clear as the emperor sends an ordinance demanding that the Jews leave the ghetto or be executed. Rabbi Low, through determination, dabbling in dark magic, creates the savior for his people. He creates the golem. The Golem, how he came into the world, completely took me by surprise when I watched it for this video. When I first researched it, I admittedly struggled to see how it was going to be a horror film, much less a film that could ever compete with my love for Dr. Caligari. And yet, here we are. The Golem's story is quite simple. Rabbi Lo creates the titular Golem as a means to keep his people safe from genocide. However, his creation ends up turning on the very people it was designed to protect. What makes this film so special to me is the careful and creative aesthetic choices made by director and star Paul Wegener. Each frame is like a painting. Now I said earlier that this film is another prime example of German Expressionism. You might be wondering how that could be true considering it has very simple muted sets combined with an almost naturalistic overall look to everything. In truth, Wegener stated multiple times since the film's release that he never intended to make an expressionist film. It most definitely qualifies, though. The characters all rely far more on physical expression than plot-oriented action, um, especially when compared to films like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and The Penalty. Furthermore, the film's interior and exterior locations are all built of strange shapes and dimensions. Wegener wanted the location of the film's story to be unique to itself and to not resemble any real place. Even the cabinet of Dr. Caligari makes clear reference to Prague and uses its aesthetic style as a means to invoke the city. Prague is nowhere to be seen on screen in the Golem. Uh, 
Such techniques are the very backbone of the German Expressionist movement. Style is used to convey a certain emotion, or vibe, if you will. Everything about the golem looks a little dusty, a little bleak. This film handles the same themes of trauma and indoctrination as Caligari, but it presents them in a more subtle way. Everyone looks tired, either from stress, loneliness, or immediate danger. Wegener's passion for the project is clear, considering how this was the third film that he had created about the creature. Sadly, the first two films are lost to time. I mentioned before, it was quite an issue. Although there is a five-minute clip from the original 1915 version that you can find online. Uh, if I can find it, I'll put it, put it in the description below. His passion is also clear in his incredibly smart optical effects. Wegener took inspiration from Max Reinhardt's work as curator and creative director at the Deutsches Theater in Berlin. He used a play of lights and shadows to transform the very few sets they had available into various locations with different tones. He used lanterns, open fireplaces, set lights, and an array of other light effects to keep everything feeling unique and magical. Speaking of which, at first I was worried that this might qualify more as a dark fantasy, but there's some incredible demonic horror in this movie. Wegener pulled out all the stops available at the time to show off grandiose seances, rampaging clay monsters, and visions of the past. Yet, my favorite effect of them all really sums up the overall vibe of the film. A simple, twinkling night sky that's so serene and vast that it makes our protagonist look quite small and insignificant in the grand scheme of things. The golem, how he came into the world, is a melancholic delight that has just enough darkness to cement it as not only one of the most beautifully told horror tales of its year, but also of all time, I would say. I could easily see my opinion on both the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and the golem changing back and forth over time, but for now, the golem stands tall as my pick as the best horror film of 1920. One thing I really want to point out in regards to the top two picks in this list is how they are representations of their time and place. Both films were made as a means to directly reference the hardships and struggles facing Germans after the events of the First World War. They each took a different approach by focusing on different specific issues. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, as a work of art, exposes the general and widespread trauma that the German people were facing upon slowly realizing how much their trust had been betrayed for political means. Every character in the film has a look in their eyes that, well, closely resembles a look by many today in the, our world. The Golem's focus is seemingly more an attempt to raise awareness for a rising issue at the time, as anti-Semitic opinion began to rise and become more public. The film's story tackles this by eerily depicting the very situation that was soon to come, an entitled and hateful ruler that flippantly calls for the removal of the Jewish people for no other crime than living in the same spaces as non-Jewish people. I feel the need to point these aspects of these films out, because not only are they products of their time, but they are incredible illustrations of how cinema can be and is used to expose oppressive systems. Filmmakers have a voice. That voice comes through in their work. It is of great importance that we, as critical viewers, keep an eye on what filmmakers are saying. Cinema is art, and all art has a political dimension. This is not to say that every horror movie has a political agenda, but rather to remind everyone that horror has always been, and will always be, a deeply political genre at its core. We are currently living through a time where the look in the eyes of our friends, families, and allies are very similar to the look in the drained and betrayed eyes of Caligari's patients. Likewise, many of us are working to fight systemic oppression and abuse much in the same way that we can see in the Golem. These films are incredibly relevant today, even 100 years later. The circumstances may be different, but the deeper themes are still evident. Part of my goal for this series is to celebrate the history of the genre I adore so dearly. The other part is to help others to see the messages within it and how horror heals. Thank you for watching this all the way through. If you liked this video, you know what to do. I'm always open for conversation on Twitter, by the way. Let's chat sometime. Until next time, stay safe and keep shocking.